who are going through so many different circumstances. So I say right now, Lord, I ask you to speak. Speak to your people and use me as your vessel. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. From the New Testament, the first book of the Gospels, Gospel according to Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, and we'll just look at uh, three verses. Those three verses will be on text, but of course there is context. That we have. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 14 through 16. If you don't have a Bible, there are some here in the center of the church. If you'd like to get one, you certainly can do that. The fifth chapter, verse 14, says from the King James Version, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Verse 15, Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Verse 16, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Amen. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Just for a show while, look at your neighbor and tell them, ignite your life. Amen. Ignite your life. Say it like you mean it. Ignite your life. Ignite your life. Amen. In order for us to really uh, get a great deposit of what God wants to give us in our spirits, we need to take a look at this word, ignite. Many of you probably have a concept in your mind what ignite means. But I looked it up in a dictionary. And the word ignite means to set on fire, or to set a blaze, or to cause a fire to occur, or to cause something to be set ablaze. And when I thought about that in relation to God's word and what I know about God, I know that it is God's will for us to be set on fire for him. I wish I had some help in the house. I know that it's God's will for us to be set on fire for the Lord. Now I believe we may have mistakenly thought about this Christian race as a Christian walk. Yes, it is a Christian walk, but more so, it's a Christian race. And many of us have the attitude that we're going to meander through this Christian journey haphazardly, doing what we want to do, when we want to do it, how we want to do it. But we must understand that this Christian race was designed by the Lord. And whenever you're in a race, you run to lose. No, no you don't run to lose? No. So when you're in a race and, and you're on the starting block, and they say, get ready, get set, go. No. When they blow the gun, you take off because what? You want to win the race. Well, why is it that when we talk about Christianity, we are so slow, we're lethargic, we're lazy, when it comes to doing things for God, we... Now, I know when we think about this Christian race, we think about it as a marathon, and it is a marathon. But just because the Christian race is a marathon, disciples of Christ shouldn't pace ourselves. God never said, but he, the race is not given to the swift or to the strong, but to those who endure to the end. Those are two scriptures that are, that are mixed up. God never said that when you enter this race, I want you to take your time. I want you to, to, 
methodically think about what you want to do before you actually do it. Take your time to make sure that your footing is sure. No, God says, if you read the Gospel of, of Mark, everything in the Gospel of Mark is immediately, sooner than soon, quicker than right now. And we mistakenly thinking that this Christian walk is not a, a race, and we think that because it's a marathon, that we need to pace ourselves and just take our time to make sure we can endure to the end. God never told us to take our time. He wants things done quickly. He wants things done efficiently. When God says move, he don't want us to say, well, Lord, let me pray about that and see if what you told me to do was really what you told me to do. Because, no, when God says move, guess what he wants us to do? He wants us to move. And when he says move, he don't want us to move like this. When God says move, we ought to take off running. How many of us have ever raised children or uh, have some children? And remember when we were, uh, or when we were kids, all of us have been kids, remember how when our, when our adults or we as adults tell our children we're going to do something, take the trash out, wash the dishes or whatever it is, and we tell them to do something, when do we want it done? We want it done right now. But how come when God tells us to do something, we, we give him that childlike mentality? You want it done now, Lord? Well, I'm busy, Father. I don't have time for that. Now, what would, would he, what would happen to our children if they said something like that to us? We would have not. There would have been two kids. We would have hit them, and they would have hit the ground. Uh, well, that's what it used to be. In this generation now, we, we, we don't operate like the old generation. My dad put the fear of God in me. But I can truly, honestly say that I have not carried that on to my children. I don't put the fear of God. They know they can only go so far. But I, I need to, if I had my dad's mentality, I mean, my dad was the one who wanted things done. And he wanted it decently. He wanted it in order. And he wanted it right now. God is the same way. God wants to do things urgently. But we have a sense of lethargic. We're lethargic when it comes to God. If there's something we want to do, we do the things we want to do. But when it comes to doing things for God, we're lethargic. We're lazy. It's as if God's not coming back soon. God wants us to do things with a sense of urgency. Time is too precious. Hell is too hot. Eternity is too long. And I don't want to miss hell. I don't want to miss heaven because I'm lethargic and lazy when it comes to doing things for God. God says it's time to make a change. When I want you to do something, I want you to do it quickly. When we are at work, when our employer tells us to do something, do we tell our employees, well, I'm not going to get to that right now because I got some other stuff I want to do. You'll be looking for a job. You'll be looking for a job. When our employers tell us, do this, do that, we, we put down outlines, we get diagrams, we get charts, we prioritize our schedule, and so we accomplish those things, knock them off one by one. But when God says, do this, I want you here at this time, I need you to do that, I need you to do the other, Lord, I'll get to it when I have time. Don't bother me with that mess. That's the attitude that we have, self-included. I'm moving on. Somebody say you're moving on. If you don't remember anything else about this message, we need to understand that we are candles. We're to let our light shine. We are to ignite. We're to be set on fire for God. And sometimes the only Jesus that people are going to see is the one that we show up. And if we are lethargic, why would somebody want to join a team that's slow? Why would somebody want to join something that's not operating efficiently? Why would somebody want to come join a church that don't start on time? Why would somebody want to come to Bible study and pass the bands and deacon? Great, the only ones here teaching. Why would somebody want to come to a church that we're not excited about? How can we expect somebody else to be excited about it? God wants us to operate with a spirit of urgency. Time is running out, time is short. God wants us to operate as if the world sees Jesus through us. If the world doesn't know about Jesus, how 
are they ever going to know if we don't show them Jesus? Sometimes the only Jesus people are going to see is the one that we portray. Look at somebody and ask them, are you demonstrating Jesus? Amen. Amen. Moving forward, moving on. As we look at this text, this was written by Matthew. And Matthew was one of the Levites. He was a tax collector. And uh, I love the intro on Matthew because it gives us all that history about Matthew, how he was a tax collector. And you know, just like we feel about the IRS agents today, they felt about tax collectors in that time. How many of you enjoy when the IRS calls your home and say you owe some money? Amen. So Matthew was hated. He was hated uh, probably because uh, they were known for taking people's money. You know, like uh, Caesar needed 10% of your, of your taxes. Well, the tax collectors would take 13%. You know, they would give Caesar his cut, his 10, but they give that other 3% they would take it for themselves. So tax collectors were dirty, they were, they were just mistreated, nobody liked them. But then Matthew met Jesus, and his life was changed. Whenever he come into true contact with the Savior, there's a change. And before we're too critical about Matthew, we know that he was a he was an ex. But there are many of us in the house today are ex something lovers. Amen. There are many of us in the house today that are ex something or other. Amen. 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 Ex-backbiters, ex-backstabbers, ex-adulterers, ex-fornicators, ex-thieves, ex-amen. We're not gone. ex -locked. Some of us are still practicing. <laughs> Amen. But what's good about that is that God can cleanse even that. He can make us whole and wash us and regenerate us and restore us. But we have to ask him I'm not saying that when we start this Christian walk that things are going to be all hunky-dory and everything's coming up roses. No, there's going to be some trying times. There's going to be some difficult situations. We're not always going to stand and sometimes we're going to fall. But when we fall, do we stay down in the mud, walking with the pigs, or do we get up and ask God, Lord, forgive me, I'm sorry, clean me, wash me, restore me, walk, help me to walk right, Lord. Help me not to fall into that trap again. Amen. We have to let our candles shine, ignite your light, ignite, set it on fire, set it ablaze. So when Matthew wrote this, there is um, this sermon that he that Matthew is writing. He's pinning Jesus' words. If you have the red letter edition, you know that this is in red, most of this is in red. In chapters five, six, and seven, this is the longest recorded sermon of Jesus. Now he may have preached others that were just as long, but this is the longest recorded. The word of God, this is the, the longest recorded sermon. And in this sermon, he starts in chapter five and ends in chapter seven. And if you have a good study Bible, you can just look at some of the pericope titles that are in your Bible, like in, 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 in the beginning of chapter five starts off, he talks about Beatitudes. And then he jumps over to the salt of the earth talks about the light of the world, talks about Christ on the law, uh, Jesus and anger, uh, Jesus teaching on adultery, on divorce, on oaths, talks about love for your enemies. In chapter six, he begins talking about almsgiving. I uh, also talk about teaching about prayer, teaching about fasting, teaching about treasures in heaven, talks about the light of the body, trust in one master, Chapter 7 talks about judging. We talked about that this morning. Uh, chapter, and then all of this is basically encapsulated into one verse. If we had to sum up Jesus' entire sermon, I believe he sums up well in Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse 12, which is called the Golden Rule. How many of you have heard of the Golden Rule? Well, Matthew 7 and 12 is the Golden Rule, and it says, Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this sums up as the law and the prophets. How much better would this world be if everybody would just follow that one verse? Do unto others as you want them to do unto you. Now, many of us flip it 
and we do to others before they do to us. But the word of God says, you know how you like to be treated? You know you like to be treated well. You know you don't like to be talked to all crazy. You know you like to be lavish and you want people to respect you. Well, the way that you want to be treated, treat others just like that. And if all if everybody in the world would follow that principle, this world there would be no more hunger, there'd be no more war, there'd be no more violence, because everybody would be loving. So we got some work to do. Somebody said we got some work to do. And they tell you they ignite your light. Ignite your light. So in chapter five, as chapter five opens up, um, Matthew begins to talk about, through Jesus' words, the Beatitudes. And in chapter five, verses three through 12, we find these Beatitudes. And these Beatitudes all begin with the word blessed. Blessed is the blessed is the blessed, all the way through. Now the, the, the word blessed, it's better translated happy. Now, what God's word is saying here is for the person to be saved, they don't have to be saved to follow these Beatitudes. But if a person is saved, these descriptive characteristics will possess their life. So let's take a look. We're going to read these Beatitudes real quickly, just in case you never have had an opportunity to know what Beatitudes are. You've heard them before, and we'll just read them real quickly. Now, of course, the NIV version probably transliterates it a little better, but it sounds so good in the King James Version. Listen to this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall seek God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men revile you and persecute you, and say all manner of evil against you, falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. Anybody heard those Beatitudes before? Amen. Now you know where they are in Matthew 5th chapter, verses 3 through 12. When Jesus finishes the Beatitudes, he moves on to the salt of the earth. Verse 13 tells us that we are the salt of the earth. Now we need to understand this message presupposes the fact that Jesus is speaking to those who are saved, to those who are uh, followers of him, disciples of Christ, if you will. Those who are Christians, of course they weren't called Christians until Acts. But those who are following Christ, disciples of Christ, he's speaking to those who know him. He's saying that you are the salt of the earth. And when he says that, he wants us to understand some principles about salt. Now, many of you know about salt. Salt seasons food and makes it taste good. Uh, salt also is a preserver. It preserves stuff. You know, I believe back in... Uh, Egyptian time, they didn't have an evolving, well, maybe they did. But I thought in my mind they used salt. They used salt for something, to, to preserve something. The Egyptians used that salt. Yeah, so they used it. Also, salt, what else salt does is it, it helps wounds. It helps wounds heal. Now, of course, if somebody pours salt into your wound, it's going to burn. But salt actually heals wounds. Ask your neighbor, are you salty? Now, when we hear that word salty, many of us think, you know, we use it in a negative connotation. But we're using it in a positive connotation today. Are you salty? Meaning, do you have the grit, the grain, that will enable you to be salt in the earth, to give people what they need, to be a preserver, to be one who uh, adds seasoning to people's lives? Are you salty? Meaning, are you the, are you the one that God can use? Are you the one that God can season uh, the world with? Without salt, the world is bland. We are the salt of the earth. The scripture goes on to say in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its savor, where shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing and to be cast out. So if we're not going to portray the characteristics of our saltiness related to God's word, 
that we are of no value. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need us. So tell your neighbor, be salty. Amen. Now we move into our text. Verse 14 says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Ye are the light of the world. When we think about light, uh, Matthew makes his point very clear through Jesus' words. Anybody ever had the opportunity to travel uh, by car or by plane at night? Anybody travel by at night? Like if you're in an airplane or, or you're in a car coming from the mountains, leaving the city or coming back to the city, and you see in the distance, you, know, you could be somewhere where it's pitch black, where it is pitch black, but then all of a sudden you begin to see the lights from the city, and you know that you're approaching the city. Maybe, maybe, maybe your city, maybe it's a different city, but you know you're approaching the city, even though it's pitch black, because the, the smallest amount of light can pierce the darkness. And what Jesus is telling us today is that we are the light of the world. Not because of anything that we've done, but because Jesus lives in us. Jesus lives in us, and because he lives in us, we are the light of the world. We are to shine our lights bright into darkness. There are many people that are hurting. There are people that are needing something. There are people that are uh, that they're hungry for the living word, but because they don't know they're hungry for the living word, they're seeking after everything else. Sex, yeah. money, drugs, yeah. and they're trying to find something that's missing, and whenever they get their hands on it and grasp it, they find out that that's not what they're looking for, so they keep on grasping and keep on grasping. What they, they have an innate earning and yearning for the Holy Spirit. They're searching, for, they're searching for Jesus, but they don't know it. We, as the light of the world, need to tell the world that they're looking for Jesus and stop looking for him in all the wrong places. We need to be the light to show them where Jesus is. Verse 15. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. But on a candlestick, and they give us light to all that are in the house. So in this verse 15, Jesus begins to tell us the purpose of lighting a candle. So the purpose of lighting a candle, and it's not rocket science, uh, you light candles because it's dark and you want to illuminate something, right? Uh, Sister Kim was telling me last night, uh, Sister Connie had the lights, the power went off or something. So I'm sure if Sister Connie didn't have any flashlights, I'm sure she got a candle, lit a match, and lit that candle. And even though the, the wick on that candle is so small, it can illuminate the entire room. And what Jesus tells us, we underestimate the light that we have. We underestimate the light that God has given us. We think, oh, well, you know, my light is not that bright. My light doesn't shine that well. Any amount of light can dispel darkness. Any amount of light can dispel darkness. Are we shining the little light that we have? Sometimes we underestimate what we have. God has given us so much. But, he, but the light on that candlestick, notice when the person lights it, they don't immediately cover it out and, and snuff it. But they light it because they want it to be illuminated. The light that Jesus gives us is to be shown, to be shown bright. We are to ignite, we're to become on fire, set on fire, set a blaze so the world can see Jesus living in us. Somebody say, ignite your light. Your light. Verse 16. Now this verse, I believe, is where the church falls. We all follow this verse. It says, let your light so shine before men, but then they see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So I think we're good. We're good at letting our light shine. That's not a problem. We're good at doing good things. We're good at doing good deeds. And we're good at letting our light shine. That's not the issue. The second part of this verse says that they may see your good works. We don't have a problem with letting people see our good works. We don't have a problem with that. You know, uh, we'll let our light shine. And we don't have a problem letting people see us doing good. As a matter of fact, we want people to see us doing good. We don't have a problem with that. But where we fall short is the third part of this verse. It says that we are to let our light shine so that men may see 
your good works. And that's when we stop. We stop. And put the period, put the exclamation point, stop it right there. Yeah. It goes on to say, so that they may glorify God, yeah. which is in heaven. Yeah. We take all the credit. We take all the glory. We take all the accolades. Where is God's glory? God gave us the light. God gave us the, the brightness that's within us. So when people, when people say, oh, you did an excellent job. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, you, you did one off. Yeah, thank you. I know. That's not the attitude you should have. Oh, you did a good job. Thank you. I give all praises to God because God was the one who gave me the light to shine. We need to make sure we reflect God's glory. He put the light in us. We need to reflect it back to him. When it comes time to take praise and accolades and accommodations, don't do it for yourself. But that's a perfect opportunity to give praise back to the master. Because the world is watching us. The world is watching us. We are the candle. We are the salt. And if our flicker, if our flame is gone dim, we need to put ourselves, we need to ignite ourselves. Ignite your light. Ignite your light. Set yourself on fire. How do I set myself on fire? That's a good question. How do you set yourself on fire? Well, you need to, we need to understand the only way we're going to set ourselves on fire is to get the fire to flame bright within us. And we need to start from the inside out. The way the fire will shine bright is we need to make sure we understand God's word. We need to be in God's word. God's word is life. God's word is light. And when we read God's word, meditate on God's word, understand God's word, then the light in us begins to build up and we're able to shine brightly. Ignite your light. As we, as we traverse this world, as we navigate life, all of us run into people who are in darkness. They're in darkness. And we know if we just think real quickly about some of the people that have crossed our paths this past week, we know that we have some friends, some family members that are in darkness. We have the light. Why do we shine the light in dark places? God has called us to be the light. A light that is set on a, on a, on a, on a hill cannot be hidden. He, we are the light of the world. And if we're not shining our light, then the world is missing out on a valuable experience. Not that we're all bad. But because Jesus in us is all that. And we're trying, to, we're trying to let the world know about the God we serve. So let your light shine bright. Ignite your flame. It's time to, I believe the Bible says it better, stir up the gifts. The Bible tells us to stir up the gifts. That's another way of saying ignite your light. Stir up your gifts. God's placed gifts within the body of Christ. And if we don't know what those gifts are, we need to ask God to reveal them to us. And if we know what our gifts are, stir them up. Begin to stir them up and get them activated. God wants us to ignite, be set on fire for him. If we don't understand anything else, understand this. That as we go through this life and we call ourselves Christians, people are watching us. And we may be the only Jesus they ever see. Ignite your life. Amen. Thank you that you have inspired us to do better, to do more, to be more efficient for you. Father God, we want our lights to shine bright. But Lord, we know that we can't do it without you. We need you to be an ever-present source and help, Father God. Lord, you told us that we could approach your throne boldly and ask you for what we needed. Lord, we need you to show us how to shine our lights bright. Lord, we know that time is running out. We know that you're coming back soon. And it's not good enough that we have lit our candles and that we are the salt of the earth, that we are the light of the world. But help us, Lord, to be salt and to be light for the world to see. So they may see the Jesus in us and ask what can they do to be saved. Let us, Lord, shine our lights in the midst of stark darkness. Help us, Lord, to be beacons. Beacons of your glory. Beacons of your holiness. 
Help us, Lord, to be a, a light that shines in darkness so the world can see the light and come one into the light. And then, Lord, let's stay one to the light. Help us not to take credit for what you've done. But help us, Lord, to reflect the glory back to you. Help us, Lord, to ignite our flames. Ignite our lights, Lord, so that we can run faster, run higher, so that we can lead others to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask Pastor Vance to come with our invitation. Sister Shalom is in the house. Amen. Amen. 